this was in the autumn of 1888. The killings took place out in a 10 week period. The killing ground was not the whole of London, it was just a walk of no more than 15 minutes across. Depending on which theory uh, you fancy, the number of victims was four, three, four, five, or even longer, uh, over a long period of time, 14. Uh, but the generally accepted number of victims is five, the canonical five. The first murder takes place on the 31st of August 1888, the last on the night of the 8th, 9th of November. Whitechapel was known as outcast London, unwanted London. It was a filthy plexus of slums. Overcrowding was gross. In some areas, uh, the number, the density of population to an acre was over 800 persons. Outside that area, no more than 50 persons to an acre. Women could earn a living, a pittance, uh, sewing on trouser buttons, uh, making sacks, and other menial tasks. Often they would have to pay for the materials uh, out, out of the small sums of money that they gained. And they would work 17, 18, 19 hours a day to make such a living. Inevitably, prostitution was an alternative to such brutal labour. Drunkenness and domestic violence to these women was also commonplace. If you take your history from the movies, uh, the prostitutes were all incredibly good looking. <laughs> they wore, the women wore these enormous cartwheel hats, their clothes were made of silk or satin, they were bright red or scarlet, the women had fancy underwear, high heel shoes, and whenever you see them in one of these films or television programs, it seems that they are continually standing on a table in some smoky East End pub with a tankard of gin in one hand, belting out a song at the tops of their voices, isn't life great, isn't life wonderful, isn't it fun to be an East End prostitute? <laughs> <laughs> That's the film and television version. The reality was much uh, more different, much more different. Four of the victims were women in their 40s, who for one reason or another had abandoned lovers, husbands, boyfriends, families, and taken a living on the streets. Gin was, uh, 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 most of them were alcoholic, gin was the popular drink. Gin was also known as mother's ruin. The argument going that the woman would be made drunk, seduced, and ruined in that sense. In the second sense, if you became pregnant, then the way to abort the child was a hot bath, a bottle of gin, and a knitting needle. This was ruination in the second sense. In appearance, the women's faces were puffy from drinking too much gin. They had cuts and bruises on their faces. They had teeth missing. Because they lived on the street, they wore everything that they owned. So they didn't wear just one long skirt. They wore perhaps two or three. Victim number four, Catherine Eddowes, she wore two full length, uh, ankle, uh, two ankle length dresses and also two ankle length petticoats. Underneath one of these skirts, they had a pocket in which they carried their few meagre possessions a comb, uh, a needle and thread, uh, a, piece of, uh, a piece of broken mirror. They weren't allowed mirror in, in the workhouses. On their feet they wore nothing elegant, woolen socks like football socks, and on their feet men's boots, men's boots with studs because they were good for walking the streets, good in a fight, good for kicking another prostitute, good on occasions even for kicking another customer. To buy one of these women would not have cost you a lot of money. The price was three threepence, tuppence, or a loaf of stale bread. To give you some idea of monetary values, it would have cost you 50% more, four and a half pennies, to have bought half a pound of cheese. That tells you the value that was put on these women's bodies. At night, they could go to a lodging house and try to get a bed. Eightpence would get a double bed, uh, fourpence would get a single bed, but for twopence, they could lean on a rope stretched across the room. So this was the glamorous life of the East End prostitute. Violence, as I've already said, was uh, very much um, a common feature uh, of their lives. Now, the Jack the River murders took place, and it would take place in the early hours of a Friday, Saturday, or a Sunday morning. Now, where would we be without the famous fog, the 
permeates, I think, every film I've ever seen about Jack the Ripper. The sorry truth is that there never was any fog. <laughs> it was all, they were, uh, and in fact, three, three of the victims were murdered on nights when it had been raining, or, or, or just stopped raining, and on the, four, one, on the fourth murder, the murder actually took place in daylight. So, no fog at all. As for the murderer himself, we don't actually know his name. The name Jack the Ripper was given to him by a journalist. It was, a ho uh, uh, it, was the, it was the result of a hoax letter. But the name has stuck. Since 1888, he's been Jack the Ripper and the murders, the Jack the Ripper murders. We don't even know his nationality. Now, contemporaries said that such a brutal, brutal killings could be only have been done by a foreigner. Uh, but today, nothing daunted. The English have claimed him very firmly as one of their own. And now Jack the Ripper features all the time in lists and books on, of English murderers. We don't even know what he looked like. He's always shown in, uh, wearing a top hat, a uh, cloak, carrying a medical bag. Um, there were only ever three possible sightings of Jack the Ripper. One of them was a part profile from behind. Two others who saw him thought, what, thought said, both said that they wouldn't have recognised him again. What has been compiled, and again this is from scattered pieces of information, is that we think, we think, he was about five foot seven in height, Range estimates range between 5'3 and 5'7. He was aged about 29 or 30 years old. Um, he had a moustache. And his clothes are described as being shabby. Uh, he, on one occasion, he's alleged to have worn an ankle length overcoat. On another, uh, a, a, a round pea cap like a sailor. And that's the best with that. And he has also, we know, anatomical and some knowledge and some surgical skill. How that knowledge was acquired. We simply don't know. He may have acquired it, was a surgeon, doctor, medical student, mortuary attendant. Possibly, and I suggest this is much more likely, he would have acquired it as a butcher or a slaughterman. Now, the doctors in uh, med, uh, top hat, the cloak and medical back, uh, bag is a much later addition. Now, one of the puzzling things about the murders is that he obviously has some sort of timetable for these killings. He signals when he's actually going to do the killings. It's the 8th, 30th, uh, 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 April 30th of the month, um, or as clo very close to it. So the first victim, she's murdered on the 31st of August, the second on the 8th of September. Two are murdered on the night of the 30th of September. Nothing happens in October. Fifth victim is killed on the night of the 8th, 9th of November. So one of the big problems is, what happened in October? Why did he not kill in that month? Was he, was he locked up himself? Was he out of the country? Was he on boat? Well, where was he? But the big one, that is one of the big mysteries. Why, where was Jack the Ripper in, in, in October? As I said, we don't know. <coughs> since, the last, since the list of suspects, as I say, we don't even know his name. <coughs> the list of suspects has grown since 1888 uh, considerably. Uh, everybody you meet has a theory about who Jack the Ripper was. I've had people phoning me up telling me that they knew who, who Jack the Ripper was. One, one lady phoned up mostly urgently to tell me that she knew who Jack the Ripper was. So when I said, well, who was Jack the Ripper? There was this long silence, so do you want to talk about it? Yes, I'll talk about it. Jack the Ripper? was Lord Randolph Churchill, Winston Churchill's father. So I said, okay, fine, why, why do you say that? Well, what did she say? He was Jack the Ripper. He lived in London and died of syphilis. <laughs> so, that was the evidence. That, that was it. She was very angry when I sort of <laughs> dismissed the, the, the very politely her theory, but these are the sort of things that are constantly being put forward. Names. The list now of suspects, uh, from away from the Scotland Yard list of possible free names is now well over 200. All sorts of names, the royal family feet inevitably, the person with Duke and Clarence features uh, prominently on the list. Um, so too, and for the reasons that's most obscure, does the author of Alice in Wonderland, <laughs> Lewis Carroll. Um, I myself have been twice named as Jack the Ripper. <laughs> True, it was in Co 
comic book and on stage, but nonetheless, uh, I have been named as Jack the Ripper. <laughs> so the hunt for the identity still continues. And at this point, as far as identity is concerned, all I can do is leave you with a rhyme popular in the East End for many years after the murders. It goes like this. I'm not a butcher, I'm not a yid, nor yet a foreign skipper. I'm just your own light-hearted friend. Yours truly, Jack the Ripper. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.